he met his life partner from a, chat, a chance encounter at a frat house. Everyone, please welcome Benji. Um, I'm going to bring you back to fall 2021. You can imagine where you were. Um, I was sitting at my dining room table, and I had just gone off a scheduled Zoom call at midnight. And I'm sitting there, and before I poured myself a second glass of bourbon, I thought, I thought to myself, what, what got me here? Why, why was I here getting off of a scheduled Zoom call at midnight? And um, well, at the time, we were, um, my company, I was one of five employees there. And we were trying to drive hard, build our product, get it out into customers, respond to what they need. And through this process of trying to deliver as quickly as possible, my colleague and I, who were the only technical people on staff at the time, found ourselves up until midnight trying to deliver. And I thought was trying to think of a way of how I could communicate this problem to my non-technical coworkers who always thought, well, the client asked for it, let's get it to them as soon as possible so we can really show value. Um, but over time, obviously this created a lot of problems. Um, and even though I came up in this world as a data scientist in a consulting type environment where I would do analysis, we would do analysis on a regular basis and then deliver it and then move on to the next thing. At this point, we were delivering things more in a, like a product company. Um, and I wasn't really familiar with this framework, but I found that this was the framework to talk about the problems we were having with my non-technical coworkers. Um, I've given this talk before, um, so and more in like a business context and less of a government policy context. So I've tried to adapt it to that, but really the lessons are the same regardless of where you're at. Um, so I'm Benji Braun. I'm the uh, chief architect at a company called uh, 202 Group slash Blue Voyant Government Solutions. We're going through a bit of a awkward rebrand right now, um, but. Um, I, I do, I've done a lot of things over the past three years, but when it was just the five of us and just two technical people, I really kind of did everything. Um, and so I have had this experience of building a product and understanding um, the problems you have when you build with tech debt, which as I'll explain is inevitable, but um, I hope that you will learn something from my mistakes so you won't have to make them yourself. Um, so the goals for this talk, I'd like to define what tech debt is. I've talked to some of you guys about this talk already, and some of you are familiar with this concept, some of you aren't, so I'd like to define it. Um, then I'd like to talk about a new way of thinking about this that you can talk about with your non-technical colleagues that will help um, help you help help you outline this problem. And then um, since I went to business school, there's going to be a framework got to have a framework, and then we'll, you know, we'll wrap it up. Um, okay, so, so definitions. What is tech debt? Here's like a pretty um, jargony example. So in software intensive systems, technical debt is a collection of design or implementation constructs that are expedient in the short term, but set up a technical context that can make future changes more costly or impossible. So what, you do something now, later you have to pay for it. You have to pay that debt back, right? Okay, Ward Cunningham, who actually coined the term, this is what he says. A little debt speeds development so long as it is paid back promptly with a rewrite, the danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. And so this is what was happening, why we were up till midnight or later really fixing these problems is because in the speed to wanna to deliver this piece of data or this feature to a client, we were writing bad code, we were doing things that were inefficient and layering on top of that. So all our problems stacked one on top of the other. Um, we weren't repaying our debt. Um, you know, or a sales product perspective, why can't our engineers just shut up and implement those features already? I'm trying to close this sale. I think like a lot of this is the perspective that technical people don't, non-technical people don't really get. Um, I think we've heard this in one of the other talks earlier today or yesterday that a lot of people think what we do is magic. Um, 
and they don't understand what takes what what takes a long time, what doesn't take a long time, why you should do things fast. So let's talk about a way from that someone can care, someone who's not technical can care. So it's not just about complaining that they can get um, they can start to care about it. Okay, so I put this in here because I definitely didn't think of myself this way, but I've started to think about it, um, especially as a in, in building a, a product. And I never thought of myself as a software engineer, but I've I've started to, and I think that's a good a good thing. So you can be a software engineer even if you don't write JavaScript or PHP or Java, you're still writing software. You're, the code you write, those scripts are pieces of software. Um, and you should try to build them in such a way so that you're not um, acquiring, writing it, you're not writing it poorly. You're doing a, but in addition to not writing it poorly, you're writing in the most optimal way possible so that it's not rebuilding the wheel every time you do it. Okay, so we, we think, and I think I've set up this, um, this, this dichotomy between like the tech side of the house and I, before I said business, but let's call it policy and like the government context between like the technical people and the al and al analysts, let's say. And that like, they're against each other, that the analysts don't understand why the tech people can't just get it done. And the tech people don't understand why the analysts keep asking them to take shortcuts and making it work worse. And this is a really big problem because your mission or like the business isn't those two competing forces, it's those two forces working together. So you need to be on the same page to, 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 to work on it and to, to figure this out. And this was a big problem the first time I tried to talk to my team about tech debt, the non-technical people, I thought it was gonna be like a really easy framework and people got really defensive with it. Um, and I think that was my fault because I didn't propose it from a business standpoint of what they could do to do, why this was better for the business, not just like why it was gonna make better code. Cause like at the end of the day, why do they care if the code's good or not, if the business outcomes are the same? Okay, so tech deck can be both a good thing or a bad thing. So. Tech debt could be a problem um, in the way that this is like a graph I've seen in a few different places, but this often happens with software organizations in general, which is that as time goes on, productivity goes down, but cost goes up. So like the idea is that, you know, it takes longer to implement those features. It takes longer to do the analysis, to build that model. What do you do? You hire more people, okay? So those, it takes those people longer and longer to do it, and instead of fixing the problem, you're just layering on top of that problem. Every time you hire new people, it makes the problem worse. Okay, but tech debt can also be an asset. So you can get your product into users' hands more quickly. You can explore product fit without making big investments. Um, and you can test new capabilities and respond, um, respond quickly. Like think of like the agile, the agile framework. Like, you do something in a, in a sprint, you see how the customer interacts with it, you can go back and make changes. Okay, so let's think of it in a way that manages these concerns. Um, so there's this concept of behavior value and structure value um, from you know, famous or infamous, depending on how you think about it, Robert C. Martin, he's, you know, he's definitely an asshole, but like, I think he's right about this. And so what he's saying is that software has two types of value. One is behavior value and one is structure value. So behavior value is the value that the stakeholder slash customer makes or saves from the product. So this is like what you get out of the, like what you actually get out of the product, right? So like um, the app, like you, people talked about a lot today about shiny apps. So like what the value the customer gets by being able to use a shiny app to download that data versus you know emailing you for it. So that's behavior value. So structure value, on the other hand, is the ease and promptness of creating and changing features in an existing system. So if, um, if we're providing someone a Shiny app and I'm like, well, you know what? I really need a, a I, I want to be able to download it as an Excel, CSV, or text. How hard it is to add that button is the structure value of, of it. 
And the value of the whole system is those together. It's both the ability to change and what it does right now. So this is the frame. So that when we came to it like that, before I get into like the framework of taking on, taking out good tech debt versus bad tech debt is, um, is that. It's that value plus structure. And this was the way that I was able to communicate to my non-technical uh, like coworkers the importance of taking this into account. So it's like, hey, so-and-so asked for this, this button or this data set, this analysis, I want to get it to them, you know, today, tomorrow. It's like, okay, well, I have, you know, all these other things going on. I can do that, but it's going to make it harder to, to, to answer the next request. So let's think about, it. is it worth it to do that? It could be, you know, you know, who's asking for it? What does it contribute to like the long-term vision of this product of this company? Or is it just like, I, I need I, I need to make the client happy. I got to do it, um, which isn't really like a good way to, you know, it's, it, like that type of development isn't like a good way to develop. Okay, so framework. Um, you know, the debt metaphor I think is a really good one in finance. They talk of, talk about like present value versus future value, and um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this concept, but that's in in finance. This is like. I take out a loan today for let's say $100 in 10 years it's, I'm going to get $110 back. So that's the present value versus the future value. So this is like the the thing with responding to a customer's need or want like does the present value I get from delivering this equal more value later on or do I get am I going to have to do more work than it's worth? Later on, I think someone earlier today was talking about like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, so good way to think about it in the same the same context. Um, so smaller or variable loan versus large fixed loan. So um, this is you know to to carry on that finance example. So is there a way to make yourself more flexible than um, than really commit right now? Um, Sometimes it's better to make a decision that is suboptimal, but it leaves your options open. Um, this could be like, look for, you know, for us, it was our cloud environment. We originally went to um, AWS commercial and we had to move over to GovCloud because of client requirements. But in the beginning, that gave us a lot more options. Um, there's a lot more services in commercial. It's less, it's less expensive um, versus going over to GovCloud, even though in the long run, that's what we needed to do. At the time, we need to keep our options open. So it was better to do that. All right, this is probably the most, I don't know if this is the most important, but I think this is a lot where you get to make a lot of different decisions about you, what you want to avoid and what you try to not want to avoid. Um, I think people incorrectly sometimes think about tech debt is write bad code now, fix it later. Um, I don't, maybe that's a type of tech debt, but I think that's just bad. Like you should just write, try to write the best code you can, um, especially because you will have to fix it later. Like you're not gonna, you will have to change that code later. And it's so much harder to change poorly written code than well-written code. Like, I mean, it's a joke, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an overused expression, um, but it's true. Like you need to write your code so that you remember it next week. I mean, you really, for me, like tomorrow. So if I wrote bad code, it's going to be hard for me to tell what it is. All the more so when you're working with a team, when you're building a product and not just doing analysis. So that's just like bad code. Okay, that's a type of tech debt. Try to write, don't, don't write bad code. Okay, but um, sometimes you take, um, you take out tech debt deliberately. So for example, um, our company right now has a, uh, like a professional front end with JavaScript developers. That's like pretty cool. Um, but originally we couldn't afford, um, you know, like an engineering staff, like a front end engineering staff. So we built um, our Markdown websites and deployed them using our Studio Connect. And it was like a good enough solution. We knew that someday that wasn't going to work anymore. 
that we were going to have to rebuild everything from scratch because we were going to outgrow that system. But it was good for then. And that, that was acknowledged versus like reckless and accidental tech debt um, for us. Um, the biggest example for us was our, our approach to cybersecurity and cybersecurity compliance. We just didn't think about it. And I've spent the past year just basically working on cybersecurity compliance, let up, not even really touching actual cybersecurity. Um, and now we finally, now, now that we finally understand the ramifications of that, we've hired someone to really like fix those problems that we've created over this year much harder to do that for a system that's already built than baking it in from the beginning. All right, design for flexibility. I think we, this we've kind of covered this in a few ways, um, but you really have to leave yourself open um, because you don't know how things are going to change. And I think a good metaphor for this is that software data science, it's not like building a house or a car. Like you you often, when you start your project or start working with a client, you don't really know where you're going. You have an idea and you're building towards that, but that's going to change as you go on. Whereas like a house, you know, I hire a general contractor to fix my kitchen. When he's done with a punch list, it's over. For a software project, for a data science project, when you're working with someone, there are going to be changes to that system through its lifetime. And that's expected. So you have to build in flexibility where you can. All right, and then the last, was I a slide? That's what I think I, I must have had a double there. And so the last thing is to invest in professional development. Um, we talked about good code, bad code decisions, but so many of these inadvertent tech debt that people take out is because they just don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And if you, as you learn more and you invest in your people to learn more, they will at least know what type of decisions they're making. Um, and I think like that's why you know we have things like this getting together here. Like I've learned so many things that I didn't know about talking to you people to help us with that. All right, so so recap. Um, so policy and tech aren't separate parts of the organization. They are the organization. You have to find a you have to think of yourselves as partners and find a way to move forward so that you're all operating together. So tech debt can be a mission problem or asset, depending on how it's management, how it's managed. You can take out bad tech debt that just um, is a that that is just with you and like a, a, a something that you're chained to as you move as you grow, or it can be something that helps you grow. And then um, Five, you know, these five points for take for managing tech debt, try to understand whether the present value is greater than the future value, whether the smaller or variable loan is, is better, that's better than taking a large fixed loan, um, making sure that you're doing things deliberately versus accidentally, if you can, building in flexibility and investing in professional development. So lastly, um, I'm actually, I've talked to a few of you about this. I'm actually writing a book about tech debt and about how it applies to not just code, but to all aspects of a technical organization. Um, and if you have war stories about times that you've, decisions you made that you wish you didn't, or times that you made quite, what may have been a questionable decision or seemed like a suboptimal decision, but that was the right decision, um, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love for you to reach out to me. Um, and, uh, thank you.